right, so we left off last time talking about some uh, features in visual cortex, right? We said that information had gone through the retina, then made it from the retina to the thalamus, specifically known as the dorsal lateral geniculate nucleus, right? You guys went home and got that tattooed on you somewhere. Uh, and then it's going up to cortex. We have primary visual cortex. From there, we're going to go to these extra strike cortical regions. That means beyond strike cortex, or V1. The reason we call it strike cortex is you can see, remember those layers that we talked about? Okay, so we have those six layers. They're very prominent layers. You can see those quite easily, right? It's actually kind of cool. Okay. There's, again, this overarching organization between what we call the dorsal stream and the ventral stream in vision. This is applies to other uh, sensory processes as well, Abby. So all of your other systems, anything that goes more dorsal is going to be uh, interested in sort of um, sort of location, like where. Things that go ventral are going to be sort of uh, what is that, right? If you want to think about this, how many of you love sharks? So that's like your dorsal fin, right? Of course, that doesn't really help because they also have ventral fins. Uh, but that's a whole separate story. But the dorsal fins are going to, you know, dorsal is going to be toward the top, right? One of the really cool vision areas that we're going to talk about, sort of in that dorsal pathway, is called MT. Just as a preview, MT is responsible for motion vision, right? So things that are moving in your visual field. Who remembers the story about putting trash cans in front of blind people? Yeah, that was a great story, right? Um, their middle temporal area, MT, your area is still getting input, right? Because it's still going to be processing that movement, and that is why uh, they can dodge those trash cans and things. Okay, so that's called MT. One of the areas in the ventral stream we'll talk a good bit about is the FFA. <coughs> that is not the Future Farmers of America. I know a number of you were part of that organization or know someone who was, right? Anybody familiar with that, Travis? Got your purple jacket at home? <laughs> do, do you? No. I mean, it's okay if you do. There's no judgment on that at all. I mean, it's a perfectly fine organization to join. Um, but they had purple jackets, right? Are they purple? I'm not great sometimes with <coughs> color labels. I have great color vision, Eric. I don't know what the colors are called. That's my problem. Uh, this is the fusiform face area. How many of you have ever seen a face? Yeah, happens once in a while, right, Jason? I mean, actually, probably, if you were going to say, like, what is the number one thing that you see your entire life, it's probably faces, right, Jared? I mean, if you're, if you're like, actually looking at things. And that's definitely a what, right? Because you want to know who is that person, so what are they, what is that object? That object is a Jared, so you can identify that based on your face. So that's kind of cool, right? I'm trying to think if I want to, there's a great story I want to give you, but I'm going to talk more about the fusiform face area later. I'm going to give you a wonderful story about chimpanzees then, okay? It's going to be thrilling. Uh, extra strike, there's the what and the where, don't worry about it, we just talked about it. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I feel like this is a really cool concept. Um, how many of you are in or have taken my sensation and perception class? Yeah. You spend a lot of time in there on this, right, Eric? And it's, it's, it's a very cool concept. I, I want to briefly touch on it so I can kind of give you an idea about what's going on. And then we're going to watch a really awesome video. And, I, and there are things I want you to pull out of the video. I want that to be more of an inspirational film uh, than, than maybe actually delivering some scientific concepts. So I'm trying to trying to shift the emphasis a little bit here. This is hard for me because, uh, Chloe, this is really exciting. And it's really exciting to me. Um, so there you go. Who remembers the retina? Yeah, so that was a thing, right? And inside that retina, we have things called ganglion cells, right? And we said those were the first guys to fire action potentials, right? in the retina. In the visual system, ganglion cells are the first ones. Now, these 
Ganglion cells have what are called receptive fields. They are responsible for part of your visual world, right? Okay. So we want to make sure that um, that we understand what that means, right? And so what we mean by that, Olivia, is if light falls on that particular part of the world for which that ganglion cell is re responsible, it's going to get excited by that. And it's going to fire action potentials, right? It's going to go, woohoo, light. It's going to be getting that information from the photoreceptor, of course, and it's going to fire action potentials. There are two ways we can structure this. We can have what are called on center and off center. Basically, what that means is if the light falls in the center of an on center, it's going to get excited. If it falls in the center of an off center, then it becomes inhibited, right? And if you look at that box indicating where the light is being presented, you can see the subsequent increase or decrease in action. Around that, we're going to have an inhibitory region as well, if it's an on-center or an excitatory region, if it's an off-center, right? So it's just going to be inverted. So I like to think about these as like donuts. Okay. How many of you like donuts? Even those of you who go, I don't eat donuts, you still like them, right? Right, Eric? I mean, it's like a, you may not have had a donut in five years, but you still like donuts, right? It's like the least offensive of foods. Some people don't like bear claws, they're a little aggressive. I think there are more donut shops per capita in this city than anywhere else in the world. Because everywhere I go, there's like another donut place. And I'm like... So Heather, I lived in, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, which is home of some wonderful things, one of which being Krispy Kreme. Uh, it's also home to a particular bank called BB&T. We have some of those here. I don't know if anybody banks at BB&T. Uh, I always joke that every other building was either uh, a Krispy Kreme or a BB&T. So you could go to the ATM and get your cash and then go buy donuts. And then when you were out of cash, we'd go back to the bank. And then you could just walk down the street and this is what would happen to you. So, but we're getting close. We have a lot of donut shops. Um, and, I, and I don't know why. And the only place I've had donuts is Jolly Pirate. I had some Jolly Pirate donuts. I guess those are, those are the, that's the original donut shop, right? All right, on and off center. Light, it's gonna excite something, um, unless it's in that inhibitory region. Why did I talk about donuts? Jasmine, in a minute, I mean like one donut's awesome, right? In a minute, I'm gonna give you a box of donuts. Not literally, but metaphorically. Get your hopes up. We have to take these receptive fields and we sort of put them on the back of your eye. That makes some sense, right? I mean, that's a way to kind of represent this. When light comes across, you know, dots of light fall wherever. We can get things excited. Um, how many of you realize not everything is a dot of light? How many of you would love to see things that are elongated, um, like, how many of you have ever been attacked with a hockey stick? No one. Um, okay, so that, that must have been a really just unique personal experience. Uh, Jason, are you all right? Okay. Have you ever played hockey? Yeah. Have you seen it? It's like the Olympics now, right? You have to watch hockey. Everybody has to be a hockey fan for like the next two weeks, right? Uh, have you seen the women's hockey team for the United States? You won't. They're so fast compared to the other team. They're just a blur. I watched them play the, um, the Olympic athletes. Seriously, I watched them play the Olympic athletes from Russia. Because you know, the Russian team's not there, but the Olympic athletes from Russia are. Uh, because Russia was banned, but that's a very complicated story. Uh, so I was watching this, and they're fast. They're like amazingly fast on the ice. And it looked like the Olympic athlete from Russia team, because I have to give them the right name, right? Was just like standing there with a stick in their hands. While the other team scored like five points. And that's like a lot, like a 5-0, that's kind of a blowout in hockey. Right? Anybody, nobody a hockey fan? Eric, are you from here? Yes, but I was stationed in Michigan like seven years, so I'm did you, do a couple Red Wings games. Did you miss the blizzard? Yeah, because they, they were, were here like probably the three weeks you were gone. Well, they were already dead. So. 
Yeah. Uh, so there you go. Man. Anybody else go to a Blizzard game while they were? Yeah. I've got a hockey puck from the inaugural game in my office. I was four and they got into a fight and they shut the game down. Wow, that's impressive. So that's, it was a really short game because I guess there was too many, I don't know what happened, but yeah, there's sort of been fighting and they just shut the game down. Yeah, there you go. If you want to see something that's not just a dot, we want to take those dots and string them together, right? So that we can see that like that's a hockey stick or um, Abby, for you, a softball bat, right? That would be something that's sort of elongated, right, for example. You, want, you don't want to see those as individual pieces, right? Like, what am I going to do with that? So what we have to do is we have to take these ganglion cell receptive fields, and we're going to, like, feed all of these together, and we're going to put them into LGN, but also up into primary visual cortex. Okay? So once we get up to primary visual cortex, then we take these receptive fields, it's hard to draw with a pen that doesn't work. Now look how we've kind of wired up these receptive fields and now we've created a box of an excitatory region in the middle so we can see this elongated thing. We can make this at different orientations, right? we can make this work. Now what, that may not make a lot of sense to you, and that's fine. So just hang there with it and we'll come back to it in a moment. What I want to do now is take a break from talking to you. Um, to give you a video for a few moments. This is a video of an experiment um, by David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel. They won the Nobel Prize for this series of experiments, actually. They did this work uh, back in the 60s, probably. And they then made this video sometime after that. Okay. But I want to make sure you can hear this. So it's not going to be ridiculously loud. We'll try it. Like, 41 is a good number. Uh, so, we'll try it there. In this video, what you are going to see is really like a projection screen. Okay, that's what you're going to see. And on that projection screen, you're going to see a bar or a dot of light moving around. Okay? Now, what you are going to hear is something completely different. What you're going to hear is actually action potentials. Okay? You're actually going to hear action potentials. Now, Ray, these action potentials have been collected through an electrode. Remember the electrodes we talked about? And we're going to send that through some amplification and filtering equipment. Don't wrap your head around that too much. And what you're going to hear at the end are just kind of little um, pops. Okay, it kind of sounds like a series of pops. When you hear more of those, that means that particular cell is more excited. When you hear less, then it's less excited, right? So we're going to we're going to see that. Uh, this was performed in a cat. You're not going to see the cat. Just letting you know, the cat is looking at the same thing you're looking at, right? It's looking at that same screen. That electrode is in its primary visual cortex, in a cell in primary uh, visual cortex, okay?
simple cell, there's a different kind of cell. you what I, what I want people to get out of that is one you can actually listen to your brain cells doing what they do which I, I think that in and of itself is pretty awesome right I mean up until this point you really had no idea that you could do that uh, I think that would be a great way if anybody wanted to start a band right I think they should start a band just recording action potentials um, and play that I think that'd be interesting so, nobody's gonna do that right Jason and the action potentials Seems like a band. Uh, so there we go. So we're going to take these receptive fields. Again, we're going to put them together in different formats, in different ways, different arrangements, so that we can go beyond just dots of light. Because Kayla, a dot of light doesn't do us any good, right? Do you do hurdles by chance? I was just asking because I know you're on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But some people do hurdles, right? And so if you think about those hurdles, that's that's an elongated <laughs> stimulus, right? And if I'm just seeing like dots. I might think I can run through that. And that could be really embarrassing. Do you know people who run hurdles? Mm -hmm. Tell them to try that next time. All right, um, how many of you are interested in color perception? No one, that's exactly what I thought. Because none of you thought about the colors of the clothing that you're wearing uh, today before you put them on, right? Did, did that come into your mind, Eloise? Like, like, like did you think about like, like your clothing to, to determine if it matched? I mean, I do most of the time, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a standard thing, right? <clears throat> uh, you also do this sometimes. How many of you eat bananas? Great, Heather. Um, so tell everybody else what a banana is. It's a fruit. It's yellow. Oh, no. Not the sour one. And it's the, the long one, not the round one. Because it could be a lemon based on your first two sort of categories, right? Okay. Uh, so, I don't know. Uh, but this is actually an important, well, I'm going to have to tell you another story. Jason, you're going to get like two primate butt stories today, and I really thought I was only going to give you one, but you're getting two. You can just take them both home. Call your grandma, say, hey, here's what we learned about today. Uh, so, 
Let's go back to the bananas, though. How many of you love eating rotten bananas? Matt's like almost like like well, banana bread. That's what I thought of immediately. Yeah, yeah, right, right. So that's that's actually a legitimate answer. Uh, color vision is awesome because it helps us determine if fruit, food, particularly fruit, is ripe or rotten, right? And there's a difference. Like, how do you know if a rotten, if a banana is rotten? It's like not yellow anymore, right? You also know if it's not ready to eat because it's also, guess what? Not yellow, right? It's green, right? And so there's a difference between the green, the yellow, and the black, right? In terms of bananas. And that seems like an important thing to know if I'm going to survive by eating fruit, right? Like, is this rotten or is it not rotten? How many of you have ever eaten a banana that was not yet ripe? It's the worst experience in your life, right? I promise you, it's horrible. The worst experience in my life. But, but banana in general. You don't like bananas? Yeah. Already got an F in this class. <laughs> yes. it takes, just takes banana. I think banana seriously. Um, actually, the nice thing, Eric, at, at my house is I like bananas that are almost on the verge of like it needs to be banana bread. Um, and my wife likes them like they're still green. And so we can buy like a big bunch of bananas, and so for like a week she will eat them, and then she stops, and then I get to eat them, because then they become edible for me. So it's really kind of nice. You should plan all of your like uh, future relationships based on banana preference, because you don't want to throw away bananas; they're expensive. Huh? Yeah. You're gonna live a lonely life. <laughs> Not just because of the banana thing, but that's going to be the main one. It's okay. My fiance doesn't like bananas either, so. Well, aren't you lucky that the two of you found each other? <laughs> 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 I did, based on our liking, not liking a banana, so. Really? Yeah. What if, like, one day he finds out he likes bananas? Like, is that going to change your life? It's over. It's over. <laughs> it's over. That's the deal breaker. It's going to come in with bananas. What about Laffy Taffy that's flavored like banana? Nothing banana. Nothing banana. <clears throat> <laughs> Color is important, right? So I guess you can avoid bananas. Um, at least you can avoid rotten fruit. Right? There's another reason color vision might actually be important, and here's what I'm going to talk about, monkey bars. <coughs> uh, humans don't do this, um, and, and it's impolite to ask. J just as a heads up, Travis, so don't. Um, a lot of other species will turn their genitals bright red when they're receptive to uh, sexual encounters, right? So when it's the fertile time of there, we would call that an estrus cycle. It's really a menstrual cycle in a non-human. It's the same thing. Uh, when they're in that fertile phase, they will turn their um, genitals, sometimes including their butts, uh, bright red, so they'll increase blood flow there as a signal that they're, um, they're receptive for uh, sexual encounters. So again, color vision is going to be pretty important in that case, right? Because you're going to go like red, not red. That's going to be important to whatever kind of behavior you're going to, going to do following that, right? <clears throat> There's a whole suite of ideas as to why in humans you, you don't turn your genitals red. Uh, not that you would have any control over it if you could, right? There you go. But in humans, we have really advanced color vision, more so than most other species. Um, most other primates have um, trichromatic vision, although there are these like colorblind squirrel monkeys, which are kind of interesting. Um, that might have been an interesting video to see, right? These colorblind squirrel monkeys that have this, uh, there's this new technique. I actually know that people who developed this technique to inject, uh, it's, like a, it's like a DNA therapy, it's like a genetic therapy to give monkeys color vision that don't have color vision. So you might think, well, that's sort of useless. Um, you know, why does a squirrel monkey need color vision if it didn't have it? I mean, some squirrel monkeys do. They're like humans, right? Like some of us are born with color vision, some people aren't. But they, uh, they can use that in humans, actually, to, to restore color vision or create color vision, which is kind of exciting. Do they get vertigo from that? Because uh, that would add depth to stuff, wouldn't it? I mean, they already have some depth perception. They're still going to be able to see contrast. Uh, I don't know. I would say that a monkey would not 
of all species, would be highly unlikely to ever get vertigo. And the reason for that is because they're going to be acrobatic movements. And so a monkey that could develop vertigo for any particular reason would be difficult. Uh, I think that would, that, would not, that would be problematic. Some of the squirrel monkeys of this species actually have trichromatic color vision and some don't. So it's, it's not that we're going from total achromatic to, to color vision. That might actually create some problems. But some members of that species have color vision just like in humans. There are sort of two different ways you can have color deficits, like color vision deficits. One is to completely miss an entire cone type. Like you could be completely absent of one of the three types of cones. The other way you can do it is you can still have three types of cones, but one of them is going to be screwed up a little bit, and it's going to shift its sensitivity closer to another. Right? Quite often happens with um, red-green color blindness. That's really the most common uh, because the red, and we'll see this in a minute, the red and the green curves are very close to each other, so they overlap on that, uh, on that visible light spectrum. And so shifting the sensitivity of your green cones or your red cones just a little bit will cause too much overlap and you won't be able to tell the difference between red and green. Most folks who are colorblind are males. The reason for that is the colorblindness gene is on the X chromosome, right? Those of you with beards only have one of those. Those of you that don't have beards, you got two of those. That's how you can tell the difference. Rub your face. If it's bristly, there you just got one. If it's the screwed up one, you're colorblind. If you're a female and one of them is screwed up, you'll just use the other one, and you're fine. Also, hemophilia is the same way, right? You're more likely to be a hemophiliac if you're male than if you're female. It's a sex-linked um, genetic disorder. <clears throat> All right, there was this guy named Young. You don't really need to know this, uh, that he was right, but he was. He said there were three different types of cones. Those are those photoreceptors. They have different absorption characteristics. Here they are. This is that curve I was telling you about for the red and the green. Some people refer to these as red, green, and blue cones. How many of you have heard that? Yeah, that's actually wrong. Um, so if you call them that, I'm not going to get too mad. But really, we want to think about these as short, medium, and long wavelength sensitive cones. And the reason for that is, yes, we do perceive short wavelengths as blue, but in reality, short wavelengths of light aren't blue, right? Jason, we just perceive them that way. Uh, so if we want to really be correct, this would be short, medium, and long. And you can see that's 419 nanometers, 531 or 559 nanometers. So that's exciting, right? All right, so this is a quick and easy test for color vision deficits, right? So if you look at this, the top should say 37, 12, and 15. If you don't see those numbers, you should see your doctor. Get your vision checked. What was that, Eloise? <laughs> Having some trouble? Uh, typically, they will give you a much larger test of color vision than this. Uh, that actually has, so these are actually not the right numbers, it's 29, 5, and 1, uh, for those of you that are like still freaking out about this. But Robin, they will give you this longer sort of test, and there are actually some that will differentiate between uh, protonopes and deuteronopes, it just depends on which cone type you're missing. And so if you are uh, protonopic, you'll kind of see one shape, and if you're deuteronopic, you'll see a different shape, um, which is actually kind of interesting. Anybody had a really extensive color vision test? Eric, I'm a little surprised you have it. That was pretty basic. Was it? Did you have to poke a moose in the nose? That's only if you're stationed in Alaska. Oh, okay. I, I took this color vision test, this vision test once, and they, they had a card that was like a 3D card, and I had to put my finger where I thought the moose's nose was. <laughs> it's like, it was like a weird thing. Uh, so there you go. Uh, you get the three cones, we've got this thing called, uh, so three primary colors, or three primary cones, again we would perceive that as uh, blue, uh, red, and green, or green and red, but there are actually sort of four primary colors, right, and one of those is yellow, and the reason, 
know, the reason we call these primary colors is if you start to think about colors in general, and you start to, Elizabeth, try to describe things as certain types of colors, it's really hard, and we're going to kind of leave black and white out of this, right? Because they're sort of uh, saturation dimensions, right? But it's really hard to describe things without using these four colors, right? Most colors you could describe as uh, some combination of other colors, like purple, for example. It's kind of like a red and a blue, right? Orange, that's kind of a red and a yellow. But what is red? Is red a combination of some other color? And it's not, right? I mean, if you were to, if you were to try to describe red, and, and they, they do this, they will ask people from a variety of cultures, they'll try to say, like, you know, tell me your color, the colors that you have in your, you know, in your society, and, and then they'll try to get down to those basic colors. It, it usually ends up coming out with the, the red, the green, the blue, and the yellow, right? That's kind of the basic. Now, there's some, Jasmine, there's some basis for the red, the green, and the blue, because we talked about those three cum types, right? The yellow is sort of a funky one, like, why is that one out there? Well, it's kind of interesting the way that you kind of would wire this up. Obviously, red is, is red, and green is green, whatever. Uh, but there are ways that you can take sort of the red and the green, and if they're both sort of active, then we'll think, well, that's, um, that's yellow, right? And that's how we'll sort of perceive these combinations of wavelengths of light. Don't worry about that too much. Oh, this is kind of fun. Um, and I think, Matt, this goes, so I'm going to remember a question from well, an entire week ago uh, that you've probably forgotten. You asked me about bleaching, and we talked about that uh, retinal pigment epithelium a little bit in relation to this. But there's also a way that you can overexcite your uh, photoreceptors, right? And then what's going to be left is just what we would call noise. Okay? Let me see if I can write that word. And what I mean by noise is sort of random baseline average action potentials, right? So at any given moment, any of your uh, ganglion cells could be firing an action potential. Any of your cells anywhere else in your brain could be firing action potentials, right? So this random thing. Uh, what would happen here is if you stare at that apple for, I don't know, usually these things take 15 or 20 minutes. To <laughs> like 30 seconds is, is, is sufficient, typically. If you stare at that and then you look over at the, the white space, what you should see is an after image of opposite colors, right? So you should see a red apple with a green leaf uh, or, or something, some approximation of that. This works not by exciting the red and the green photoreceptors in that particular place, Eric, but because where the apple is, we have completely exhausted all of those green photoreceptors. When you look away and those green photoreceptors are no longer active, the other photoreceptors are, their baseline activity, right, is sort of above, okay, it's kind of like a tug of war. How many of you have ever been in a tug of war? You guys ever done one of these? Okay. Um, you can look really awesome at tug of war if the other team doesn't pull on the rope, right? Okay, that's like the quickest way to win is make sure the other team doesn't pull. And that's exactly what happens here. When you look at that after image, you've exhausted the green. And when you look over at the white space, the green team's no longer pulling, so the red team wins. Does that make sense? Hopefully some. Enough. Mm, don't worry about this magnocellular, parvocellular business. We already talked what and where, color vision. All right, we should talk about some of these areas that are uh, in extra strike cortex. These are going to be brain regions beyond primary cortex, brain regions that process higher components of vision, right? <clears throat> so there is a color sensitive area called V8. And it's just visual area 8. I know that. Such a creative name uh, for, for a brain region, right? How do we know that this actually works? Well, there are two approaches. One is always the fMRI study. That's a fun one. You stick somebody in an fMRI tube, have them look at some achromatic images, and then have them look at, which is an image that doesn't have colors, it's just going to be grayscale. And then you have them look at an image that does contain colors, 
and you see which brain areas are active only in the color vision category, color stimulus, and not in the achromatic stimulus. You subtract the activity. Some areas are going to be active in both cases, right? And then the area that's left over, we're going to call that V8. So there's that. The other way to do this is to go around and randomly find 92 people and then hit them in the head right at region V8 so that part is damaged and then see if they have color and vision. It's not exactly how that would happen. Uh, but there were 92 folks who have <coughs> chromatopsia, which means that they cannot see color, but there is not a problem with their retina, right? There are individuals who do not have cones or all of their cones are screwed up. They're not going to be seeing colors either, right? But that doesn't mean that they have brain damage. Their retina is just not working. These individuals had perfectly good retinas. They had all three cone types, everything was working well up until the point it got up to area V8 and the, uh, the color information was lost. So there you go, this is, this is where V8 is located. No worries there. Uh, area V2 is going to be responsible for form, that's going to be like shapes. Remember, uh, we want to have, that's a fun shape, right? I don't even know what that is. Um, supposed to be a cube, it didn't work. So, anyway, uh, form is important. We're going to take those small bits and we're going to kind of string those together. This is called spatial, this is actually kind of interesting, spatial frequency. This is really what we're testing when we test your visual acuity. Okay? How many of you have taken a visual acuity test? How many of you have looked at an eye chart? That's a, that's a visual acuity test, right? Uh, basically what we're asking you is how how small can we make the, uh, alternating bars and you still be able to tell me how many bars there are? Now we usually don't do that with like a patch of dark and light bars. We usually do it with a patch of dark and light bars that we've put in the shape of a letter. Right, so if you think about the letter E, Travis, that's just a series of dark and light bars, right? And so we can see how small can we make that E and you still go, that's an E, instead of telling me it's a W or something. Right? So we're going to test your visual acuity that way. How many of you have 20-20 vision? No one? No, no one's going to admit to having 20-20 vision. Abby, like, almost wants to. Is it better than 20-20? That's a possibility, right? Like, like 20.02? No, nobody has vision like that. Um, some people, have, like, 2015 is probably a reasonable 2010, maybe, um, right? So it can be better than 2020. Basically, what that means is at 20 feet, you see as though you showed at 20 feet, right? So at 20 feet away, Eric, that object looks like it should if it was 20 feet away from you. That's what 2020 means. If it's 2200, how many of you have 2200 vision? Some people who are wearing glasses, you might have 2200. That means at 20 feet, that object looks like it's 200 feet away. That's how clear it is to you. Um, and that's why you need glasses to bring that back. If you had 2010 uh, vision, like Abby over here, whose new nickname is going to be like Hawkeye, I think. Um, is that a, I don't know if you have a nickname. You should work on that. Should, everybody should have a nickname. That's just, you can like write that on your bag, your glove. Super eye, I don't know, is that, is that any better? Uh, if you had 2010 vision at 20 feet, it would actually look like it was only 10 feet away from you. Not that it would be that big, but it would be that well resolved. Right, you would be able to count those bars. So there you go. Anybody excited by that? Nobody's excited by that. Anybody want to have better than 20-20 vision? Yeah, it might be useful. Hey, who loves Abraham Lincoln? Uh, why do I bring up Abraham Lincoln? Well, yesterday was his birthday. That was kind of a big one, right? Nobody had a big celebration for Abraham Lincoln's birthday. That's disappointing. Uh, these two pictures have um, the same amount of what we call low frequency information, but the picture on the right, we've actually removed some extra what we call high frequency information, right? So if you go back to this, there are these sort of like low frequency, and then there are these sort of high frequency changes in contrast, right? And that makes a complete difference when you're looking at an object or you're looking at something. 
How many of you have seen that picture of uh, Albert Einstein that turns into Marilyn Monroe? Chloe, you have that at home, like on your well, you were like the only person who nodded your head on there, like, oh yeah. I'm a huge fan of both yeah. Albert <laughs> Einstein <laughs> and Marilyn Monroe. And I just I can't decide where to stand in my my home and I just move back and forth so I can see both pictures simultaneously. Yeah. That's, what you do. that's what I'd imagine. Um, so there you go. And that's just gonna be changes in the spatial frequency are gonna actually cause that. Mm, don't worry about this too much, but here are just a couple other areas that are responsible for form. Again, what, what does category selective mean? That means we're saying what is it, right? Because it's a sort of category. Notice where these are all going. They're all going down that ventral path, right? They're all kind of on the bottom of the brain. This, is, this has been rotated, so that's why it looks, taking that brain and just rotated it sort of 90 degrees on its side, so you can see the bottom of it. So that's kind of cool. There are a number of folks who have some type of visual agnosia. That means they, they can't identify objects, they can't see certain things. There is a particular kind of agnosia where you don't recognize faces. That can be a real problem. Okay? Most of us identify each other by our faces. Right? Now, who's ready for primate butt story number two? Here it is. I know, Heather, you're like, I'm ready. Uh, there's an area in your brain called the fusiform face area. And that particular part of your brain is responsible for identifying faces. If you show a person a face, that part of their brain gets really excited. So that's awesome. Chimpanzees may or may not have a fusiform face area. They may not identify each other based on their faces. There was a video, like they do these eye tracking experiments, right? And they'll do this. How many of you love art? Anybody an art fan in general? Yeah. So, Matt, they'll do these, they'll show you a famous painting, right? And so, like, what's your, you have a famous particular piece of artwork that you like. Um, you, could, you could name anything at this point. No one else in this class would know if that was real or not. Um, so, you're going to have this piece of artwork. What they'll do sometimes is they'll they'll do these eye tracking experiments where they'll see where your eyes go, right? And so they'll track your eyes as you're looking. That's pretty cool, right? They'll track your eyes while you're looking at famous art, and then they'll look and see if everybody kind of looks at art the same way, right? And you kind of see where where do the lines draw you, where, where are you moving around in the picture and the story and so forth, and how does that work? So they did an eye tracking experiment. They didn't give chimpanzees or, or um, like artwork to look at. But they, they gave a chimpanzee another chimpanzee to look at. And what they noticed is when they did the eye tracking on this, it was a male chimpanzee watching a female chimpanzee walk, just happened to be how it was set up here. Uh, they noticed that that chimpanzee's eyes kept going like face butt, face butt, face butt, face butt, the whole time. It was just face butt, face butt, face butt, as this chimpanzee was walking here. And that seems like a little weird, right? Uh, except remember that story I told you about the red butts, right? So maybe that was. What they found a, a few years later is actually kind of interesting, is all chimpanzee butts are different. And I know you're thinking like, well, all people butts are different too. And, and I'm going to assume they are. Most people wear pants, so there's no real opportunity to test that, right, Jared? You just kind of have to go with it. Um, but chimpanzee butts are actually different because they have different wrinkles. Uh, and I, I know, again, you're going to think, well, like, human butts too, but... Uh, but they have different patterns of wrinkles that are actually identifiable by other chimpanzees. So you can show the chimpanzee pictures of other chimpanzee butts, and they can tell you if they know that chimpanzee or not, just based on the wrinkle pattern of their butt. I don't know about you, Travis, but I find that kind of fascinating, actually, right? I mean, it's like, one, how did you get that study approved? I always think about these things, right? Like, like some guys, like, you know what? I'm going to go around and take a bunch of pictures of chimpanzee butts. And I'm going to get another chimpanzee and just show them these pictures and see if they can identify who these butts are. Is that, is that, how do you write that up? I don't know. Seems pretty interesting, right? So I think, this is me, I think chimpanzees have a fusiform butt area uh, where they're using instead of faces, right? So for you, Eric, you look at somebody's face and you go like, I know that person. But if you were a chimpanzee, you'd go, I know that chimpanzee's butt, I know who that is. And that part of your brain gets excited so you know what chimpanzee it is. That's pretty cool, right? 
I thought it was exciting. Jason's like, man, not so much. I don't know what else you were expecting from a primate butt story, but I, I thought that was delivered. Why is uh, facial recognition so important? Well, it's extremely important because we live in a social sort of situation, right? You guys realize that, right? You interact with other people. It's important to know who those other people are, right? Because uh, I will tell you this, and this is, this is just as a heads up out there for those of you who might try this. Claiming to have prosognosia will not be a good excuse for your significant other to explain your behavior. Like, I didn't recognize, right, Jared? Like, I didn't recognize her face. Like, I can't tell who that is. Who are you? I don't know. I know your voice, but not your face. Not going to work. You're really going to have to work on establishing that ahead of time. Right? Don't just, like, pull that one out of nowhere. Okay. Other questions about faces? Hey, how many of you love paper wasps? They're wasps. This is a species of wasp. Uh, they also have facial recognition. So you think, like, why would a wasp have facial recognition? They also live in social societies, right? And so they they did this, Matt. And they would, um, so they would show a face, and they would shock. Uh, you, apparently you can shock a wasp. I didn't know you could do this. And then they would have another face, and the wasp wouldn't get shocked. And then they would give the wasp the opportunity to choose faces, and would choose the one that where it didn't get shocked. Um, and it was a wasp face, not a human face. They tried it with other objects, and it didn't work. So they tried like triangles and stars, all kinds of different patterns, uh, and it didn't work. It also didn't work if they mixed up the wasp faces. So if they took off the antennas or something, that didn't really seem to work. Uh, but wasp, paper wasps actually have like different facial patterns, like they have these black and yellow stripes. Don't worry about this. This is just, again, talking about the fusiform face area. You get really excited for faces. <clears throat> sort of gets excited for headless bodies, too. You see a headless body, uh, Justin, your, your fusiform face area is going to get excited about that. It makes some sense. You have an area called the extra stripe body area. Now, that does really get excited when you see headless bodies and body parts. Uh, most of the time, they will show you pictures of the body. They're just going to like randomly pull out a leg and go, hey. I can think of that setting too, right? Like we're going to traumatize people, showing them like bodies without heads, and just like random limbs. Nobody thought that was interesting. Don't worry about the period of camp place here. That's fine. Uh, we still want to talk about faces. There are features, contours, configuration of features. Most faces contain the same basic elements, though, right? And if I said, hey, draw a face. Most of you will give me a couple eyes, a nose, a mouth, maybe some ears, a little bit of hair, eyebrows. Right? That's, that's sort of what you get. This is actually interesting, though. This is a brain scan from an eight-year-old child, and these have, these have actually been mathematically adjusted to sort of scale for size. Look at that fusiform face area in the eight-year-old child. Look how small that is. And here's an adult. Look how much larger their fusiform face area is. How many faces have you seen when you're eight compared to when you're like 28? Like a lot less, right? So you don't have as much experience, Jasmine, with faces, and so maybe you're not as good as discerning who people are based on their faces, right? But when you get older, you get better at that. So it's a, you can actually practice and, and, and study there. Uh, we could talk a little bit about depth perception. We do have binocular vision. That means we have two eyes. And there's some overlap of those visual fields. There's considerable overlap. You can test this by closing one eye and then closing the other eye, but open the first eye, right? And you can see, like the part in the middle that you can still see is uh, the binocular region. There are a lot of things that we can do to determine depth perception. Interestingly, Matt, you were asking about depth perception. Most of these are what we call monocular cues or artist cues, right? So you're a big art fan. You can know that in a 2D image, you can uh, create the perception of depth, right? You can do this by perspective, relative size, uh, loss of details through atmospheric haze. Okay, so you can do the, you can kind of make things fuzzy. They appear farther away, right? Things that are closed. Um, and then, 
movement of the retinal image with head movement, that's kind of interesting. Um, how many of you have ever ridden in a car? Okay, so we're narrowing this down. Uh, right, so you've been in a car, and you've uh, been driving, and there was like, let's imagine a, a field, and there was a cow way out in the field, and next to the road there's a fence, and so those fence posts seem to be going by really fast, right? Uh, but that cow seems to just be creeping along, right? In reality, you are moving, assuming the cow is stationary and the fence is as well, you are moving at the same speed relative to the fence post and the cow, right? But because that cow is at a greater distance, it appears to move more slowly. So you can determine that it's part of the way because it seems to be moving more slowly. Okay, we already talked about this. This is just some slides demonstrating that orientation sensitivity from that video. Optic flow, that's important for visual motion. There's a visual deficit called akinetopsia. This is damage to area V5 or MST. You're unable to perceive movement. That seems problematic. Right? So if things are moving, you can't see them. So think about all the things that are moving right now. None of that would you be able to see. Think about all the things that move when you walk, which is everything, right? None of which you would be able to see. It's pretty crazy, right? Don't worry about any of this. Don't worry about that either. All right. Questions about vision. What do you do for the people who like can't see things that are moving? 